If you have your Bibles this morning, oh, let me turn this on. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'd encourage you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 5 and 6. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. Let me set this over here. When you find it, if you would, now have you stand again just briefly as we read from God's Word. The first letter to Timothy, written by the Apostle Paul, and he makes the following statement to young Timothy in verses 5 and 6. He says, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. The testimony given at the proper time. You see, there is God and there is man. But there is a mediator. Not just a mediator, there is specifically one mediator. The mediator between God and man. And that is the person of Jesus Christ. If you've ever been involved in mediation, you know that a mediator is someone who is tasked with resolving disputes or conflicts between two parties. And the mediator, through the discussion and through the conversation and hearing both sides of the story, the mediator comes up with a mutual resolution that resolves the separation or the conflict between the two uh, opposing factions, if you will. Well, in this case, God and man are separated, and the problem that is separating them, the, the issue at hand is sin. And Jesus has come as our mediator to resolve the sin issue so that God and man might be reconciled. What a beautiful t teaching in the New Testament we find. Jesus, the mediator. But I want to submit to you this morning, and I'm going to show you in the text today, that the idea of Jesus as our mediator is not a concept limited solely to the New Testament. We find imagery and foreshadowing of this throughout Scripture, and we'll see it in our Old Testament passage in Genesis today. Let's pray. Father God, as we begin to proclaim your word this morning and to receive it and to listen to what you would be saying, I pray that you would speak through me to make clear the powerful teachings of your word, that we might hear your voice, that we might receive it joyfully, and that we might apply it to our lives so that we can be transformed by it. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're being seated, turn back to Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27, where we continue our study of the patriarchs this morning. This series now has been going on for four months approximately. And today's message is the 16th message in the series. Now the reason I point that out today is because after today's message, we will be halfway through this series. And so, we're almost to the point of no return. It'd be closer to the end than the beginning after today. And so I hope that you have been enriched by and edified by the series through the patriarchs, the chosen church series. I know that as I have studied for these messages, I have grown in my walk with the Lord and my understanding of Scripture and I'm looking forward to the next few months as we start the downhill side of this series and bring it to a close later this year. 
Quickly, by way of review, last week in chapter 26, we read that Isaac and his family were basically pushed out of the valley of Gerar by the Philistines that were living there. They moved to Beersheba. We saw that in the closing verses of chapter 26, which is situated in southern Canaan in an area that was influenced by the Philistines but was not specifically a part of Philistine territory. They were living, if you will, kind of on the border, the southern regions of Canaan. It would be like if we lived in Laredo. There would definitely be Mexican influence, although we are in the United States. They were living in an extremely southern portion of Canaan in Beersheba, by the way, where Abraham had lived during his lifetime for a period of time as well. The events that take place today will happen during this portion of Isaac and Rebekah and his family's life while they were living in Beersheba. Now, if you look closely at the verses there on your bulletin, you notice that we're going to try to cover two chapters today. So buckle up. I'm going to move through these somewhat quickly and because of the length of the chapters and the fact that we're covering two of them, I'm not going to read all the verses to you like you typically do. And so I would ask that as I preach today that you would read these uh, verses in these chapters uh, while you're listening. I promise you, you will get more from reading the Bible personally than you will from hearing someone talk about it. The reason I say that is because these are God's spoken words. And I can promise you this, you need God's spoken words much more than you need my spoken words. Or even a learned commentator and pastor much wiser than I am, and there are plenty of those. So I encourage you to read the text as we preach this morning, but I am going to read some of it as time allows. And so the first point this morning is called deception. Deception. All of the points you notice on your outline start with D today. Starting in verse 1, it says, Now it came about when Isaac was old and his eyes were too dim to see that he called his older son Esau and said to him, My son. And he said, Here I am. And Isaac said, Behold now, I am old and I do not know the day of my death. So take your gear and your quiver and your bow and go out into the field and hunt game for me and prepare for me a savory dish for me such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat so that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebecca was listening while Esau spoke to his, or while Isaac spoke to his son Esau and when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it home, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, Behold, I heard your father speaking to your brother Esau saying, Bring me some game and prepare us every dish for me that I may eat and then bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, listen to me and do as I command you. And if you continue reading, you will see that Rebekah proceeds to give Jacob some instructions as to what he needs to do in order to perpetuate a deception of their father Isaac into believing that he is Jacob. Listen, Jacob believed his death was imminent. We can glean that, obviously, from the first few verses of this text. But I want to tell you that, full disclosure, Isaac did not die. How do we know that? Well, we know it because later in the series in Genesis chapter 35, which is several chapters down the road from where we are, we read of the account of Isaac's death. And the context allows us to know that Isaac's death took place after Jacob, after Jacob had fled to Padamaran, after Jacob got married not just once but twice, and after Jacob had 12 children, and returned to Canaan. So Isaac was obviously suffering some type of affliction. 
it was obviously severe, severe enough that he thought he was going to die, severe enough that it had impaired his eyesight significantly. And in light of these circumstances, not only did Isaac think he was going to die, but obviously his family thought he might die as well. And so Isaac decided to go ahead and confer the blessing of the firstborn to his son Esau, who was born seconds before Jacob. Remember, they were twins. So as we begin reading here in this chapter, Isaac asked his son Esau, who was his favorite, to go hunting and to kill some savory game and to bring it home and to prepare it for them to eat and following the meal or perhaps during the meal, it was Isaac's intention to go ahead and give the blessing to his son Esau. But Rebekah, Isaac's wife, and the mother of Esau and Jacob overheard the conversation. And she knew in her heart of hearts she must intervene. Now you might ask, how did she know? Because God had told her. Remember back in Genesis chapter 25, specifically verse 23, that when Rebekah was about to give birth to the twins Esau and Jacob, God revealed to Rebekah that the older, that would be Esau, would serve the younger, who was Jacob. In other words, Jacob would be the son of promise. Jacob would be the recipient of God's promised covenant. Not Esau. Rebecca knew this. Scripture never says anywhere that she told Isaac or that God told Isaac. And so Rebecca, knowing that Esau was not the person that was supposed to receive the blessing, quickly devised a plan to ensure that Jacob received the blessing instead. And so if you read through this text, and it's a story I'm sure you've heard before, she summons Jacob to herself and any related servants that might have helped her in this scheme. And she dispatches them to go and to kill some animals and to prepare a delicious meal. And then she proceeds to disguise her son Jacob as his brother Esau. Specifically, she takes some animal skins and covers his body so that he will feel hairy because Esau was a hairy man and Jacob was, according to the Bible, a smooth man. She dresses Jacob in Esau's clothing so that he will smell like Esau. And she even gives Jacob some instructions about what to say and probably some instructions not to say anything if possible or to limit your talking as much as possible. Because obviously you're going to have to try to disguise your voice. And in these verses, 1 through 29, Jacob goes along with Rebekah's plan. Now, he goes in, dressed as Esau, and his father listens to his voice because he can't see well, and he says, Sounds like Jacob. If you read the text, there's some confusion in Isaac's mind. And Jacob comes in claiming that he has gone hunting and that he has killed the animals and that he's brought the prepared food and there is all of the things are in place to pull off the deception. But his voice just isn't right. And Isaac thinks something's not right here. Come come closer. 
And so Jacob, pretending to be Esau, approaches his father. And his father reaches out and feels the skin and feels the, the, the hair of the, of the animal. But he, he feels like Esau. And he smells the clothes and it, it smells like Esau. But it, it sounds like Jacob. And so following in verse 18, it says, Then he came to his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Finally, Isaac just flat out asked, Who, who are you? And Jacob says to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. And as you read through that, Isaac becomes convinced that Jacob is in fact Esau. And so, believing him to be his brother, Isaac confers the blessing upon Jacob. You can read the blessing in verses 27, 28, and 29. Deception, trickery. Jacob has come in and fooled his father into believing that he is Esau. And Isaac has unknowingly, unwittingly blessed Jacob instead of Esau. Deception. The second point is disappointment. Disappointment. Let's continue in verse 30. Now it came about, as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had hardly gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. And he also made savory food, and he brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. And Isaac, his father, said to him, Who are you? And he said, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau, who has hunted game and who has brought it to me so that... I, uh, uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, I'm your firstborn, Esau. And Isaac trembled violently and said, Who then was he who hunted game and brought it to me? so that I ate all of it before you came and blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceeding great and bitter cry and said, Bless me even so also my father. And the story continues through the conclusion of this chapter. Isaac had blessed Jacob. And as soon as that was completed, Jacob departed. But Scripture said he had hardly gone out. When Esau came back from the hunt, remember Esau had been out killing the game and doing exactly what Isaac had told him to do. And Esau returned home and prepared that which he had killed and he brought it to his father Isaac. And when Esau arrived and began to speak and began to confer that he was there with the game and that they could eat and then, and then he could bless him, Isaac realized, whoa, I just did that. And as the conversation continued, Isaac realized that he had been tricked. He had mistakenly conferred the blessing upon Jacob, believing him to be Esau, and now Esau was there in front of him. And so he began to explain to Esau that he had mistakenly given his blessing to Jacob, given the blessing to Jacob, and he went on to say that it couldn't be revoked. He said, he, he will be blessed. 
In other words, I can't, once it's out of my mouth, I can't put it back in the bottle. Have you ever said anything that you wish you could take back? Once it's out there, it's out there. And so Esau was heartbroken. He was devastated. He was disappointed. Disappointment. And he said, Father, please, please, please give me, the, give, me, give me a blessing. And Isaac agreed to do so. And you can read the blessing that Isaac spoke over Esau. You can read it in verse 29 and 40. Uh, verse 39 and 40. But it was not the blessing intended for the, the, the firstborn. It was a lesser blessing. It was a secondary blessing. And it did not satisfy Esau's uh, jealousy or, or his, his disappointed heart. And Esau's sadness quickly turned into anger. Look at verse 41. So Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of the morning of my father are near, and then I will kill my brother Jacob. Esau was upset. He was furious. And his plan was to kill his brother Jacob. But, he wanted to wait until after Isaac passed away and the period of mourning was completed. He didn't want his father Isaac to die and his brother Jacob to be killed right there together in, the, in, the, in a period of, of roughly a few days. He, he thought, I can hold in my fury and my anger for the sake of my mom and my family until after such time as my dad has passed away and we've been able to adequately mourn his death. Now, as I told you at the outset, I, Isaac didn't pass away. He got better. But nevertheless, there was a period of time, and during that period of time, if you read the rest of the text, Rebecca found out what Esau was planning. And Rebecca knew she needed to act again. And so she went to her husband, Isaac, and asked Isaac to send Jacob away to, the, their, to their homeland, to the land of their relatives, just as Abraham had done to Isaac a generation earlier. Now, Abraham didn't send Isaac specifically but Abraham sent a servant, remember, to go get him a wife. Now it's a generation later, and Isaac is now the, the leader, the head of the family. And Rebecca approaches him and says, Would you send Jacob to our homeland to get a wife from among our relatives? Now, her purpose was twofold. One, yes, Jacob needed to marry a, a godly believing wife and not one of the women from among the Canaanites who were pagan. Two, this would keep him safe because <laughs> it would keep him away from Esau who hopefully while he was gone his fury would subside at least somewhat. Now what I want you to notice throughout this entire chapter is that though Jacob is the one actually doing the trickery, all of the plans, all of the, the orchestration behind the scenes, all of it is being perpetrated by Rebecca. Rebecca's the one who devised the plan who prepared the food and who dressed Jacob up in a disguise and who told him what to say and who sent him in there 
And Rebecca is now the one who is trying to come up with a way to keep Jacob safe as the fallout of the trickery is unfolding. So both Rebecca and Jacob have acted deceitfully and deceptively, but I want you to consider that they are not the only ones at fault. If you remember a couple of weeks ago in Genesis chapter 25, the Bible records a story which we talked about in which Esau sold his birthright to Jacob in exchange for a bowl of stew. It was a ludicrous thing for him to do. His birthright as the firstborn son entitled him a double portion of the inheritance. And Isaac was a pretty wealthy guy, just like Abraham was before him. But Isaac, oh, I'm sorry, Esau, in his haste and in his foolishness, lacking any appreciation or gratitude or any recognition of the tremendous value and the honor that it was to have the birthright, he, he, he forfeited all of that and gave it over to Jacob. Now, stay with me. Jacob now has the birthright, not Esau. And while generally speaking, in the overwhelming majority of cases, the older son received the blessing, the reason the older son received the blessing is because he had the birthright. But when Esau traded over his birthright, the blessing went with the birthright. Jacob was elevated to the higher, higher status. And so Esau was not entitled to receive the blessing of the firstborn because he had ceded the birthright of the firstborn. It was not his blessing to receive. Now, stay with me. There is no indication in the text that Isaac, the father, knew this. There's no indication that he was ever told that the birthright had been transferred from Esau to his younger brother Jacob. And so Isaac was proceeding to go, at, go about as he thought was correct and to confer the blessing on the firstborn Esau, believing him to be the possessor of the birthright. Now, Isaac didn't know, but Esau did know. Esau did know. Esau knew that he was not entitled to the blessing. It was Jacob's blessing. He had given it to Jacob. He had forfeited his claim to it. But he knew that. And yet, he conveniently forgets to tell his father, doesn't he? And he proceeds in an attempt to receive the blessing that should be Jacob's blessing. Now, I'm not trying to excuse the trickery of Jacob and Rebekah, for that matter. They could have been more honest. They could have been more forthcoming and more transparent with Isaac. 
But what I'm trying to point out to you is this. Yes, we call this the stolen blessing, but the question is, was Jacob trying to steal Esau's blessing like is traditionally thought of? Or was Esau trying to steal Jacob's blessing by not revealing the truth? Well, I suppose we could look at it either way. But it's certainly a legitimate question to ask, isn't it? Let's look at chapter 28 quickly. The third point this morning is departure. So we've had deceit, deception, we've had disappointment, and now we have departure. Look at the first verses of this chapter. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise and go to Paden Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and from there take a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples, and may he also give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants, that you may possess the land of your sojournings, and that the, God, the, the Lord your God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to pay to Aaron to the, to, uh, the home of uh, Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. So Isaac departs. He, he, I'm sorry, Jacob departs. Isaac sends Jacob to their homeland to the homeland of his maternal grandfather, that would be Rebekah's father, Bethuel. And he instructed him to marry one of his uncle, uncle's daughters, his uncle Laban. Now, we've met these characters before, remember? A generation earlier, when Abraham sent the servant to get Isaac's bride, he came to the house of Bethuel, and he met Laban, and he met Rebecca, and he explained to them why he was there, and they gave Rebecca to him, and he brought him back to Isaac. And now we're a generation later, and now Jacob is being sent by Isaac back to the same place to his mother, his mother's brother Laban, his uncle, and he's instructed to marry from among his daughters, to marry a bride from among his own people, a believer. And so Jacob departs from their home in Beersheba and journeys northward through Canaan on his way to marry one of these girls. I want you to notice here that it says Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. Now, just a few verses previous, Jacob tricked Isaac into receiving a blessing that Isaac did not intend, though it was God's plan, Isaac did not intend to give it to Jacob. But here, just a few verses later, Jacob receives Isaac's full, unreserved blessing. Apparently, Isaac is not upset at Jacob or Rebekah for what had happened. Apparently, Isaac now is fully aware and cognizant that Jacob is the chosen son, that Jacob is the son of promise, and Jacob confers, as you noticed in those verses, the blessings of Abraham, or Isaac confers the blessings of Abraham upon Jacob. Now, Scripture doesn't give us the details, but I submit to you that somehow in this process... Isaac came to the understanding in the revelation that Esau was not the son of promise that Jacob was. And that everything that happened in chapter 27 was God's plan and God's will and God's design. So here in these verses, he knowingly blesses Jacob. It's not accident. He recognizes Jacob as the son of promise 
And he blesses him without any reservation with the blessing of Abraham. Now if you pick up in verse 6, it says that Esau was watching. And to summarize those verses, he saw that Isaac had sent his brother Jacob away to the land of Paden Aram to marry from among their relatives. And Esau realized that his marriages, which we mentioned in the previous chapter, his marriages to the daughters of the Hittites, to the Canaanites, to the local people, were displeasing to his parents. He realized it. You see, the son of promise wasn't to marry the, the, the uh, non-believers of the land. And he realized that his marriages were, were a cause of consternation. They were causing grief. And so what does he do? Well, Esau, it says in verse 8, Esau saw the daughters of Canaan displeased his father Isaac. So Esau went to Ishmael and married. Besides the wives that he had, Mahalah, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nabiath. Now, what happens here? Esau sees that his marriages are displeasing. He looks at Isaac, uh, he looks at Jacob, his brother. Jacob is going to his uncle's house to to marry a, a daughter that is that is pleasing to his his parents. So what does he do? He also goes to another uncle's house and marries a daughter. He is copying Jacob. You see, Laban was Rebekah's brother, but who was Ishmael? Isaac's brother. Their other uncle. In this little scenario, we see imagery of a son trying to copy another son. It is foreshadowing or a picture to the acts of the Antichrist in the last days trying to mimic, trying to pretend trying to act like the true Son of God, Jesus Christ. But the fact of the matter remains. Esau, his actions were futile. His status in the family had already been established and he was not. He was not the chosen son. But Jacob departed, heading towards Haran. And let's look at the last point, dream. Dream, as we close the chapter today. Starting in verse 10. So Jacob departed from Beersheba and went towards Haran. And he came to a certain place and he spent the night there. Because the sun had set, he took one of the stones and placed it under his head, and he lay down at that place. And he had a dream, and behold, there was a ladder that was set on the earth, and its top reached into the heavens. And he, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood up above it and said, I am the Lord God, the God of your father Abraham, Isaac, and Je or Abraham, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and the east and the north and the south. And in your descendants all the families of the earth will be blessed. And behold, I will be with you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, and I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place, there is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob left Beersheba, commissioned by his father at his mother's urging to send him away. And he was going to choose a bride. And so he journeyed northward 
through the land of Canaan back towards Haran, the city where his mother's family lived. The scripture says he stopped at a certain place to spend the night. And he took a stone and used it for a pillow. And I don't know how that would be comfortable, but that's what he did. Some nights I feel like I'm sleeping on a stone. But nevertheless, as he slept, he had a dream. And this dream was of a ladder that stretched from heaven down to the earth. And as he dreamed, he saw angels climbing up and, and down the ladder. And the voice of the Lord spoke to him, and the voice of the Lord extended to him the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. And there are three major promises to the Abrahamic covenant. And they're all included right here in these verses. One, I will multiply your descendants greatly so that they become a great nation. He promised this to Abraham. He continued it through Isaac. And now God himself is officially extending it through Jacob. Two, your multitude of descendants will dwell in this land that I have given to you as an eternal inheritance. Remember, Jacob was traveling northward back to where his homeland originally was. So he was walking right through Canaan. And as he was droning through, God said, look all around you, north, south, east, west. This is the land where your descendants will live. A great nation in the land of promise. And then lastly, and through your descendants, who would eventually become Israel, who would eventually become the Jewish people, I will bless the entire world through you. God makes the promise to Jacob. And Jacob rises up early in the morning, verse 18, and takes the stone that was under his head, sets it up as a pillar, and he names the place Bethel. In other words, Jacob wakes up from his sleep, and he is blown away. If you follow the, the scriptural record, this is the very first encounter between God and Jacob. This is the first recorded time that the Lord speaks to Jacob. And when he does, Jacob is like, Whoa! Wow! He wakes up. He says, Man, I didn't know. <laughs> and he, he sets up the rock that he slept on last night as his pillow, sets it up, and he pours oil on it, and he makes a little kind of a monument. And he's excited. And he, and, he, and he wants to worship the Lord. And look at verse 20. It says, And Jacob made a vow, saying, If God be with me and keep me on this journey that I take, and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and all of, and, and all, all of that that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Now, Jacob's excited. This is his first real encounter with the Lord. So we need to cut him a little slack. The words he says here, all well-intentioned, are, are not the best way to approach God. Did you notice it? If you do this, then I will do that. God, if you will bless me, if you will protect me, if you will bring me back to this land after I, after I get through and in, in the country of my relatives, if you will guide my steps, if, if you will do all these things, then, then I will worship you and you will be my God and I'll even, I'll even give you 10% of, of uh, all, all the provisions that I have. God, if you do this, then I'll do that. Now, is that an appropriate way to approach the Lord? No. Scripture makes that clear throughout. But can I ask you this? Who among us has never made a deal with God? Anybody? God, if you'll do this, then I promise I'll do that. No, it's, it's not appropriate to do. But we've all done it. 
Jacob was excited. Jacob was new in his relationship with the Lord. Maybe we should cut Jacob a little slack here. Rather than focusing on the deal, as we close today, what I want to focus on instead is the dream. Let's focus on the dream. Jacob saw a ladder extending from the earth to heaven. Some translators actually take this Hebrew word and translate it stairway. Perhaps you have heard of Jacob's ladder or even heard the line stairway to heaven. This imagery is still used in modern times. We see it in literature. We see it in music. We've even seen it in media. But the question is, what does this dream really mean? Well, most scholars interpret Jacob's dream symbolically or figuratively. You see, Jacob's ladder was a bridge or a, a connection between heaven and earth, between God and man. If you look carefully, it says that the Lord was standing there beside him. The, the Lord spoke. The Lord extended the ladder to man. He initiated that process. Now that's important because if you contrast that with the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel represented man's effort to reach God. And what happened? It failed miserably. But here we see God descending to man. A ladder, a bridge, a connection. And ultimately it is a picture of Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the connection. Jesus is, as we said at the outset, the mediator between God and man. Jesus is the person through whom God has access to us. But God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Jesus is the access through which we as sinners have to God. Scripture says that if we believe in Him, we will not perish but have eternal life. Jesus is the ladder. There on the bottom of your bulletin it says, The ladder between God and man is Jesus. Through Him, the Lord reaches down to sinners and gives them access to salvation and forgiveness.